My name is Walter Boynton, and I'm uh, an ecologist. I uh, work at the Chesapeake Biological Lab in Solomons, and that's part of the University of Maryland. I, um, I first came to the lab in 1969, and I was a summer student, and I thought, I'm going to be a marine biologist. Actually, when I got there, I found out that what they wanted me to do was to run the Xerox machine. So my earliest days in marine science were, were getting books out of the library and Xeroxing articles. So to a certain extent, it's been uphill since then. I went off to graduate school after a bit at CBL, and as the fates would have it, when I finished at the University of Florida, I was offered a job at um, CBL, and my wife and I looked at each other. Um, and said, you know what, we met there, we went a courting on the big pier in front of CBL, we had a good time, let's go back. And so we went back to the lab in 1975 and we have been here ever since. And um, I expect we'll finish our days out here. Uh, I think I was at CBL for a very short time when I um, met Bernie Fowler. Um, at, when I first got back there, uh, there were issues emerging about uh, water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, actually more than just water quality, um, issues about the habitat, uh, the loss of the seagrasses, uh, changes in the fisheries, um, the decline of oysters. Um, and and uh, there were people like Bernie, I wish there were more of them, who were asking questions about uh, what's going on. and. Um, I don't know if it's just me and my personality, but I thought that um, being able to, to take some of this scientific stuff, which often can be pretty technical, translate it, and talk to someone like Bernie about, about it uh, was uh, useful. Um, it was exciting at times, and it was also pretty scary at times. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think, and... Uh, up to this day, I still think it's a, a good thing to do. Uh, one of the rules, one of the lessons I learned from Bernie was that, um, uh, and I try to apply this in my, my science stuff, is uh, that you need to tell all the different groups the same story. Um, you got to tell them the same story. Sometimes uh, people will clap, and other times people really don't want to hear that. But um, it, it's, I think, something that, that Bernie gave to me um, was this business about tell them the same story. So we've been working together, I guess, for, um, let me count them out, 75, 85, 95, 05. <sighs> It'll be 40 years next year. That's a long time. And um, every minute I've involved with, with him has been uh, worthwhile. So I'm glad to be here. One of the most embarrassing times in my life, uh, Mike Miller said uh, he and Clay Mitchell at the time, they wanted to uh, replace Jack Witten because Jack had kind of always welcomed out on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. And I was in the Senate then and was a member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Would you, would you find us a good candidate? And I said... I really would. I'll try my best. So the first person who came to mind was Dr. Cronin. And uh, I called him on home at his house. He had they left the, the laboratory there uh -huh. at the house. And because uh, he went to Boston with me one time, you know, and was fighting over Molly's leg down there and they were holding it up. The uh, uh, some environmental agency or something, uh, EPA or somebody. And uh, so we flew to Boston, uh, and Cronin went with me. We flew to Boston to talk to a friend of his who was field director, and it took in this area. And I, all I did was kind of introduce myself, and we chatted for a little bit, but Cronin, they were bosom buddies. They must have went to school or something. And they, he said, oh, he said, I'll, I'll take care of that for you. I'll take care of that for you. Next thing I know, the permit was freed up. So we got to be friends talking, coming back, and I said, are you pretty much uh, resolved to, to full retirement now? He said, no, he said, Bernie, he said, I'd really, like to, I'd really like to continue doing some things. I don't know what that'd be, but he said, my affection is really in the bay. 
and the rivers and all. So I called him at home, and uh, Dr. Crumlin, you're just burning foul. Senator, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. Look, I, I don't want to embarrass myself by asking you this, but we need a good person, a good person on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Is it any chance that you could find time, you know, they, they pay your transportation and all, food and everything. Uh, is there any way you could find time? I, I know this is a burden for you. He shot right back and said, oh, said, I'd love to do it for you. I'll do it for you. So I go back to Mr. Miller and Mr. Mitchell and I say, I got you one. I couldn't get a better one. I said, uh, Dr. Cronin, that was uh, executive director of the Chesapeake Biological Club. Oh, yeah, Mitchell, but oh, I know him well, yeah. I said, well, he's, he's a smart man and he really knows the Bay. I mean, you, you couldn't get a better choice. About a week later, they called me on the phone and said, uh, Mr. Cronin, Dr. Cronin is not acceptable for the appointment. Now, I got to call him. I told him, I said, I'm almost in tears. I'm so embarrassed. But somebody up there is, for some reason or other, don't feel like you belong on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. I don't have the foggiest know who. I found it was Clay Mitchell. And he said, Bernie, don't feel bad about it. I'm not surprised. So I got another call from Mike. He said, can you try one more time? And I said, yeah, I'll try one more time. I want to see somebody on it that's that's going to be a good contributing member. I said, well, yeah, I'll call old Harry Hughes. He and I got along good. He won't do it, but at least I'll call him. Called him over there, and I swear, Walter, I didn't say ten words. And he said, buddy, what do you want? And I said, what I want, you probably won't want to do. I want you to be a member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. We really need somebody like you. He said, same thing, Walter, uh, same thing, Dr. Cronin said, I'll do it for you, Bernie. Oh, man, I'm in Hall Cabin. There's no way they'll turn Harry Hughes down. So I go back to him. Harry Hughes is, uh, is willing to serve, and uh, it's going to be hard for you to turn him down. And, okay, we'll let you know in a couple of days. Got another phone call. They wouldn't take him. And I said, my God, I can't. I said, well, look, you forget it. I'm out of it now. I'm out of it. Don't, don't bother. They held that open because they knew that I was going to retire from the Senate. They held that open for six months. And after I retired, as soon as I left the Senate, I got a call from Mike, uh, Clay Mitchell and I really want you to serve on the Chesapeake Bay Commission as a citizen representative. So why did they send you off on these recruiting missions? They were sincere. They trusted me that I'd bring people in that would, would have the kind of stature and equipment to, to do the job. But for some reason or other, I don't think Mike liked Harry Hughes, and I don't think Clay Mitchell liked Dr. Cronin, for whatever the reason. That was Eastern Shore. And, uh, but can you imagine turning two tycoons down like that? And, oh, my, what contributors they would have been. Yeah, but, and no reason was ever given for those rejections. No, they didn't give me. I asked him, I said, could you tell me why? Mike told me, he said, well, it, it's something personal with him, Clay. I don't know what it is, Bernie. I really don't know. And I don't think Clay will tell you if he ask you. So I didn't bother to ask him. Wow. I went back to Mike and I said, Harry Hughes? He said, well, Harry's had his day and his son. I said, yeah, but he's so valuable. He's so valuable. So I figured it was Mike that knocked Harry Hughes off. But, I, man, yeah. I, was, I was so embarrassed when I had to call him back. And the governor, I, I don't know how to tell you this. And I said, but... They've turned you down over there. You think President, they felt they'd be too strong? I mean, your next governor, he could carry a fair amount. Well, he, they may have figured, like I use the expression sometimes, it's like the fly, uh, the, the fly swallow sitting among the flies, you know. Uh, it might have been that, but I, I, he was so humble and so genuine. I've worked with him yeah. since uh, we both... I, I met him at one of the, some of that that we filmed, and uh, ran into him. Cool guy. I ran into oh, him. he was he was super. Ran into him at Camden Yards. He was standing in line to get a hot dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes it was like 
He was such a gen or still is such a genuine person. Yeah. Oh, he was. How did he get to be governor? He's the only he, governor would look at you and say, I'll do it. Or, no, I can't do it. And that was it. O'Malley strung me along for, oh, I guess, six years. And when I tried to get him to use the Patuxent, are you familiar with that? The yeah, Patuxent's a laboratory. We made a couple of trips. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, he finally wrote me that letter which you saw and helped me frame another letter to send back to him. Did you uh, hear any response to that letter? Never did. I did get a chance to tell him you're still wrong. I said, Governor, you're still wrong on that. <laughs> I put my arm around him like it. I'd love you, but you're still wrong on that. I'm telling you. He well, said, you know, I mean, he was really wrong because, I mean, the, the I thought that uh, the governor took a real cheap shot by saying, um, you know, uh, we, we can't, you know, cater to the desires of, of one person in one river. Yeah. And I completely ignored the fact that I mean, you've been on the on the Chesapeake Bay Commission involved with that program for yeah, yeah. A, a zillion years. I mean, really, I really first got started in 1969. That's 45 years ago. And today, right, so should we start this interview, Michael? I've been recording. I've been recording. Huh? I've been recording. Oh, you yeah? <laughs> have. <laughs> well, Bernie, let me let me. This is a question I wanted to answer to. Oh, okay. All right. So. Uh, when did you first get interested in environmental issues? Um, was it was it before or after your service in World War II? In other words, when you were really young, were you um, yeah. interested in environmental stuff? No, because I was uh, uh, free foot and fancy free, and uh, uh, I was kind of naive, and really didn't uh, didn't think we had a any kind of resource that was expendable. I just thought this is the way life is, you know, I never paid it any mind. It wasn't until 1969, after uh, operating Bernie's boats at Broom's Island for a number of years, and after my family started to grow, I decided I want to get away from working on the Sabbath. So I sold the place, I made a few dollars on it. It was going good at that time. And uh, then when I'd go back to Crab and all, I'd see the water was starting to get a little cloudy. This was in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And it was really when 69 when I made my first appeal. And that was, uh, I was president of the Prince Frederick PTA at the time. And I said, you know, I've just, uh, in my final remarks, I've got a little something I want to let you people know about. It. Uh, it may not come as a surprise to you, but I am deeply concerned about the water quality in our Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries, and Patuxent River in particular. I grew up on that river. I worked that river. My parents worked that river. My grandparents worked that river. And I said, we have, uh, we've got problems coming up, and uh, I just want to put that bug in your ear so that you'll know there's something wrong out there in the river. And the way the river goes, the bay is going to go the same way. That was back in 1960. I was president of the... Uh, uh, president of the uh, PTA in Prince Frederick and also president of the Board of Education at the time. Mm -hmm. So I had some ears that I could talk to, you know. Right. So, that, so when you, so you had already started in a, those were appointed offices, right? They were, that was appointed so in those days, yeah, it was for six your, years. Your elected political career, were environmental issues a big part of that? Oh, that yeah. Effort? And, yeah. and when did that occur? When were you first elected to the... I campaigned in 1970, made up my mind in 1969. That was my last year to serve on the board. And I told the... I wrote a letter to the governor's office and told him I did not wish to be reappointed to the Board of Education. I had other uh, public plans. I didn't tell him I was going to run for county commission. I have other public plans. And I'm uh, very grateful for the opportunity. It's been a great experience. So then... I began to create a little corn pone campaign for county commissioner. And uh, we spent the total sum of $152 to get elected. My family was small. We had them all dressed up in sporty hats and everything and uh, vote for my dad. And they had banners on, you know. And we'd go into the uh, Rum Point, the Ranch Club, Solomon's, at an old Chrysler. And we'd drive along in that Chrysler, you know. and. They'd be walking slowly beside the car, and 
uh, they'd knock on doors and while I'm going to this door, they'd go to another door and knock and the people would be waiting for me when I got there. And I'd just give them a little spiel that, you know, this is, uh, uh, my name is Bernie Fellow. I know who you are, Bernie, someone would say. And some of them didn't know me from Adam. And I'd say, I, uh, I have some concerns and I'm sincere about this. I want this job. I want this job because I think I can make a difference in Corbett County and uh, I'm going to run hard for it, and I want you to take a look at me and remember me, and please remember me on November when we when we get to the election. That's how it got going. Oh, that is amazing. Um, so when when you started this, I should tell you that, you know, you know that I've done a whole lot of reviewing of work on the Patuxent River. Oh, my. And, and your, your view in 1969 of something is going wrong here, was within about five, maybe even just four years of when scientific measurements first, they first emerged that things are really changing here. So yeah. you, your, your personal observations fit with the science pretty doggone well, which is, so congratulations. It's just like a member of your family, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, one of them get a little sick, uh, you know, they're sluggish, you feel the fart, you got a little temperature, well, something's wrong with Bernie today, or something's wrong with Mona today. And that's the way the river was with me, because I knew every inch of that river, and I knew there was something wrong. All of a sudden, you can't see the bottom, the water's getting cloudy, that grass that we hated, because, you know, it would <laughs> tie your engines up and all, was disappearing, and I talked to some of the older watermen, and they said, well, it's Probably going through a cycle, it'll be all right, Bernie. And I said, I don't know. I'm not so sure about it because you know the uh, the abolition of the of the grasses and uh, you know the transparency of the water. It's so strange. This used to be so clear, and you could see so good. And uh, uh, that's that's when I really felt in my heart, in mind, that something was wrong. But I didn't have the foggiest notion. So that leads me to the next thing is, is that, tell, tell me about when you first met some folks at CBL. Oh, I, 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 I don't know, I, I have my father kind of sets a road map and has for my life because we were invited to play ball by the Chesapeake, uh, guys there in Chesapeake Lab, and we went down to the old BG&E field, played ball, had a good time. I think we won the game, but that was unimportant. It was a fellowship. And while doing so, I was able to talk with a number of the scientists. And one that was uh, very outspoken and seemed like he was really hungry to talk to me because the papers had picked up on some of the comments I'd made and people knew that I was growling a little bit about it. And uh, he called me aside and he told me, he said, look, he said, you're, right on, you're right on target. Things are changing out there. Then he began to talk about unification and all that was all over my head. I said, now, you got to understand one thing, Donald. I'm not a scientist. I don't have a strong biological background, so you got to make it simple so I understand it. And his name was Don Heinley, who was an uh, uh, absolutely uh, brilliant mind. He knew, the, uh, he knew the elements involved in the demise of the water quality. He knew how to articulate it, and he had the courage of his conviction that he would refuse to be pushed around or throttled. <coughs> he knew the dangers of not cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. And so at that ball game, we got very acquainted, and he told me then, he said, I'll be willing to help you in any way I can. I, I like what you're doing. and." Uh, what you're doing I can't do, but I can provide you with all the information you need to keep you rolling. And uh, Don Heinley made some very strong statements, and I used them, and I quoted him. And uh, uh, there was a time when uh, uh, even in his family, the University of Maryland was putting pressure on him to be less vocal because they were getting instructions from higher-ups. But Don Heinley would not waver. Uh, I don't mean that he was mean-spirited. He was just committed to what he believed and knew was right. 
And uh, that's the problem we have in the world today. If everybody would just do what's right, that's the right thing to do, uh, where would be better off? And Don Heine was one of those people. He believed in doing what was right. He knew what was wrong with the river. He knew what needed to be done to clean that river up. And uh, so uh, whenever he told me something, that was my marching orders. I never questioned him. And then I began to get little tidbits back from people on the inside that were putting pressure on Don. They wanted him to uh, uh, make things sound a little better than they really did. And that's still happening, incidentally, today. I won't name any names, but that's still happening today. It's going on. Uh, but Don stuck to his guns, and it came a time when it just reached a point where because of uh, uh, they obstructed some, uh, uh, I think, worthy promotions he should have had, didn't get them, and he finally packed his bag and went out to the West Coast. And uh, sadly, that's where he died. And uh, when they called and told me that he had passed away, it uh, it it, it kind of cracked my heart because uh, he's a man like Walter Boynton and I have impeccable faith then. And uh, know that uh, their, their minds and their heart are clean and uh, uh, they don't know how to spell unselfishness. They don't know what that means because, uh, uh, I mean selfishness. Uh, they do what they know is right. And uh, that's what all the world ought to be doing. Unfortunately, it's not taking place. But Don passed on, and I remember at one of the wait ins, uh, uh, we did a memorial service for him, which we have for several people. And uh, I still have the reef up in the shed up there and have the remarks that I made at that, at that occasion. And uh, we became fast friends. Uh, he and Joe Mahersky, uh, uh, George Krantz, who was the oyster expert from over in Oxford, uh, we got to be good friends. And that was the beginning of a, of a friendship that has meant so much to me, but more than that has meant so much to the whole Bay Movement. And the absence of having that connection and that just uh, humongous bank of resource and knowledge from these smart scientists and they were so factual they're so factual sometimes they'd make me mad because I wanted a yes or a no and sometimes they couldn't give me a yes or no but uh, they were good friends and stuck with me all the way and they are still you yourself uh, Walter Boynton have been a, a real jewel you've never ever slackened you say what you think is right you stand up for it, and you've kept me well informed and helped me on many of occasions. And I, I am not ungrateful for it, I can tell you that. But that was the beginning of my friendship with Chesapeake Biological Lab. And I always, privately and publicly, let people know they, one of the greatest things that happened in favor of the Chesapeake Bay was when uh, Dr. Reginald Truitt, very stubborn man, but a very bright man, decided he wanted to open up a laboratory down at Solomon's. And that was the beginning of something real nice and uh, rest his soul. And he deserved the rest, but uh, that, was, uh, that, was the, uh, that was the benchmark. That was the genesis, really, of bringing together some data so that you had some factual stuff to work with. And... Uh, the education that they gave me down there, like I told you earlier, I couldn't spell unification when first started, but after they finished with me, I could I could talk science with with the most of them, you know. Yes, I mean that's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so the, your first sense of things changing in the river were seagrasses were going away, the water was getting cloudy. Were were there any indications that? People were catching fewer crabs or fewer oysters, or, or with the, um, you know, there used to be a lot of shore saners. Um, were, were you seeing a decline in those activities because yes. people weren't catching things? Yeah, we we were we uh, were seeing a decline in aquatic life, and uh, as a, a testimony to that, there was a lady uh, named Dixie Buck at Brooms Island. And I always called her the champion of the Patuxent River because she could catch soft crabs when nobody else could. 
and she had the record down there. I think it should be in the Guinness Book of Record, really. She caught 25 dozen soft shell crabs in one day by herself, <laughs> crabbing both ties, and she sold them for a penny apiece. Twelve cents a dozen, that was the going price for them. They were so plentiful that uh, if they couldn't sell them, they slapped the hogs. That's what they fed the hogs with soft shell crabs, nice pat soft shell crabs. Uh, but she told me, I remember so succinctly, she said to me, Bernie, I appreciate what you're doing. I hope you're not too late, but something's wrong. This water is getting cloudy, you cannot see. And she says, I don't know what it is. Said, I have to pick my spots to crab, and in some areas you can't even crab. She said, I'm crabbing in mud streaks now. And that was foreign to me, and I said, Dixie, what is a mud streak? She said, well, what you do when you're crabbing in Nan's Cove, and that's all mud bottom. It's a lot of crabs in there. And when a crab hears or sees a boat coming, they'll go offshore. When they go offshore, you can't see the crab, but you can see the mud that that crab's stirring up, and you dip in front of that mud streak. That's how you catch the crab. So they had techniques, but uh, that's an indication of the changes that were transisting at that time. Wow. Huh. So, um, what was the first political action relative to the environment that, that, that you instigated when you were on the Board of County Commissioners? Was it the, um, uh, and all three, all three Maryland counties were involved, weren't they? Carl Charles and St. Mary's. Yeah, and who was on the board at, at, in Calvert County? In Calvert County, there was a three-member board at that yeah. time. It was Dr. George Williams from the 1st District, uh, myself from the 2nd District, and uh, Gordon Truman from the 3rd District. He lived in St. Leonard's. And uh, they were good commissioners, and they, for the most part, were very amenable to environmental considerations. Dr. Williams in particular, and I had suggested to them that, uh, you know, that uh, things are not right in the Patuxent River, and I think we ought to start sounding the alarm because we're going to be really affected, and in doing so, it just might garner up, you know, support from some of the regulators at, and, and the governor's office. Then, uh, subsequent to that, we met the first time with the Tri-County Council, uh, they went out on the governor's yacht. I think it was in Maryland then, Governor Mandel. And uh, that's when we got acquainted with the the uh, retiring commissioners from the three counties, and we they got a chance to meet the new commissioners coming on board. That was in 19, early 1971. Uh, it was a pleasant trip. They had some real standard bearers on there, but uh, they were totally oblivious to the kind of anxiety was building up in me because of the deterioration of the river. And uh, so I, I broke it to them on that first trip, you know, that uh, I want you all to keep one thing in mind. Our water quality and our tributaries is beginning to go downhill. That's not good for anybody. It's not good for our oarsmen. It's not good for our crabbers. It's not good for our fishermen not good for recreation, and it will not be good for your children because there will come a time if we don't do something about it, it may be where they can't even swim in it. And uh, I sounded the alarm pretty early. Uh, didn't get much feedback at that time, didn't expect to. I just wanted to sow the seed, and I got that job done. And then uh, uh, my good friend Tom Rum, and he is just that. Uh, he's been my friend since way back when, when he was a delegate. All during my public career, Tom was always very helpful. I'd counsel with him time and time again. We became a judge. That didn't bother him. He was a judge. I could still sit and talk with him and ask him questions. Uh, Tom Rymer was a very bright man. He had two degrees. He graduated from Cornell, which, uh, you know, you got to have a little bit of something between the years to get out of there. And he had a... Uh, degree in engineering, and he soon decided that was not going to be his forte, so he decided to go back, go to law school, so he did, and he turned out to be a fine practicing attorney, and ultimately, as you and I know, he became, uh, he became a circuit court judge and a very good one. 
and uh, right now he's uh, slowed down quite a bit. Uh, his recall is not what it used to be, but uh, his heart and his head is still involved in the, in the good things in life, the important things in life. So how does this play into this early discussion with the, the commissioners from all three southern Maryland counties? How does that play into the Pleasant Peninsula plan? Was that before or after that? That was, uh, mm -hmm. that was after that. That was after that. What, what happened, uh, uh, Judge Rahm and I used to have little informal conversations. So finally he said, you know what I'm going to do? He said, I'm chairman of Tri-County Council. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appoint a natural resources committee and I'm going to make you chairman of it. And, and that'll be your, you do the head hunting on that one. But I think you're, you're on fire for it. So you go ahead, you've got free reign, do whatever you need to do, we'll pay for it. So I became the chairman of the first natural resources committee ever for the Tri-County Council. And I collected all of my stuff pretty good. By that time now, we've made friends with Chesapeake Biological Lab, and now they're, they're beginning to uh, educate this old Brumstown country boy, you know, in a scientific way, so that I, I understood, you know, the transparency, here's why it's happening the way it is. And this is why the grass is leaving. And uh, I could explain the uh, overinduction of the nutrients and all, and uh, that, that's how it got started. But I chaired that committee, and I chaired that committee with the determination that we were going to find out what was wrong with that river and how we could fix that river. And uh, the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory was right behind me. It was like I was a member of the group, you know, part of the family. Uh, and I remember years later, I don't remember all of the details of this, it was meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. I'd buttonhole every one of them and talk to them, one on one. We had a big meeting over at uh, Shorter's yeah. Restaurant in Benedict. I was going to ask you about that meeting. So okay. I'm glad you're talking about it. <laughs> I guess I'm ahead of you a little bit. But, no, you're right on track. But uh, we, we had that big meeting. And uh, I had written out an outline of things that I wanted to say. And uh, it, was a, it was a very passionate speech, you know. And, and uh, in fact, I had several of the members, uh, Commissioner Arnold, pulled his handkerchief out while I was talking. I see him go, he told me later, he said, you made me cry tonight, <laughs> you know, because uh, I was really pleading for the river is dying, here's why it's dying, and I could give him now because of the, of the effective instruction I had from Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. I could give them some facts and give them some reasons for it all happening. Now we're up into the 70s, mm -hmm. and uh, everything went along good, and that night, uh, my final part of the speech, I've got it around here somewhere, there's a, there's a tape of it, you can hardly make it out because whoever taped it was too far from me. Tom Horton tried to interpret it one time and he was unable to get all of it. But it, uh, it got headlines in the papers, both papers at that time, even the Corbett Independent that never wrote anything, uh, you know, about a Democrat. It was a Republican paper. If it was, it was bad, but they, they said uh, uh, kudos to Bernie Fowler, you know, and had a nice article about this speech I made over it. Uh, I've got copies of all that stuff in my news clips. And uh, I simply told them the river's dying. Make no mistake, we've been to see the governor at that time, Governor Mandel, and Bernie, there's nothing wrong with it. I talked to Jim Coulter all the time. Jim Coulter was Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources. Talked to him all the time. There's nothing wrong with the Patuxent River. Absolutely nothing wrong. It's healthy as it can be. The bay is healthy. What you're doing, the dialogue you're having down there, you're going to be chasing tourists away from Southern Maryland. They won't come to the Chesapeake Bay. They won't go out there if they think there's something wrong with the bay. And I said, well, that's still not an excuse for me not to tell the truth, Governor. I have to be honest with you. There is something wrong with the bay. I know there's something wrong with the bay, regardless of Mr. Coulter's telling you. And uh, I said, we have worked with all of them, and they all tell me the same thing. We, we, we talked with the governor, Governor Mandel, and he, nothing wrong with the bay. We talked to Jim Coulter. You know, if you don't, if you don't uh, have this uh, environmental jargon, 
you know, against the Patuxent River and against the Chesapeake Bay. So we're doing things now that's going to get more hookups, people off septic tanks, get them into wastewater treatment plants. And uh, I kind of figured then that, you know, that things weren't quite kosher in camp. But uh, we got very little help. Went to the Attorney General, who was Mr. Birch at the time, patted me on the back, we'll, we'll get some things straight for you. Uh, it never happened. They may have, you know, uh, find somebody for a little something, but uh, not nothing significant that would change the tide of the course of events for the Patuxent River. And uh, you know, when you have you have something in your head is one thing, but when that transmits to your heart, and at night when you go to bed you think about it, when you wake up in the morning you think about it, it's hard not to do something about it. So we were on a roll. And after finishing that speech at Schroeder's that night, I, I finally told him, I said, we can do one of two things. We can put up a nice monument recognizing the good this river has been, and the tide's going to ebb and flow twice in 24 hours, regardless of what we do. If the river gets so thick that you can, you can walk on it, it's still going to ebb and flow. That's, nature's going to make it do that. But I said, we're losing the river, and it's not too distant, we're going to lose the river. And I had a lot of the facts I'd got from CBL that I quoted. And uh, after a, a sort of a tear-jerky speech, I finally told him, the river's dying, we can put up this monument, thank the river for all the good things it's done for us, and close the books, or we can come together the way I think we should as a trio of counties, three southern Maryland counties, Put up taxpayers' money. This is for the citizens, and I'm not afraid to spend the money for a great cause. And let's find a good team of environmental attorneys and see if there's any recourse whatsoever that we'll find in the courts. So, with that in mind, uh, they, they agreed. That's the night that uh, Senator Bailey cut. I got a sneeze coming up. <laughs> Every once in a while. Come on. There he goes. That's better. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bailey was at that meeting at Shorter's. And when I said, and the second thing is we need to find a good environmental attorney, pay him what he needs, and give him instructions to look hard to see if we have any recourse in the courts at all. Then if, if that's negative, we've done all we can do at this point. We'll have to come up with another plan. But that's my strong recommendation. Old Senator Baylor jumped up. I can see him now. The rest of his soul, he said, Commissioner Fowler's right. You're going to get nowhere until you sue the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> and that became, a, that became a buzzword all over the area then. And Senator Bailey was from St. Mary's here. Senator Bailey was from St. Mary's, and he was a real legend up in the, uh, in the State House. He and Senator Hall served together. And uh, they were a great team, but uh, Bailey was... Uh, a very lovable person. He was a, a renowned musician. He played the clarinet, and he'd take that clarinet wherever he went. And all you had to do was say, "You going to play for us tonight, Paul?" And he'd get that old clarinet out and start playing away, kind of like Harry Hughes and his trumpet. You know, he played the trumpet for us all the time. But uh, so, who else? The county commissioners in St. Mary's County, not not the state senators, but the county commissioners in St. Mary's and Charles. You were able to bring them on board? Bring them on board. We tried to bring the whole Tri-County Council, and then the, the, the attorney that we hired, we hired the attorney. This was Dave Flyshaker? David Flyshaker, yeah, yeah, you got him. A little guy, but so yeah, tall, yeah, red yeah. hair. Yeah. Smart as a whip, but he looked like, oh, my. Well, it looked like he was in high school. Oh, my. Yeah. But he was so good, and uh, we uh, uh, had planned to use the whole Tri-County Council. Then he picked up on it real quickly. He said, I've researched uh, the article on that and said, you can't, a sister agency can't sue the state. Oh, okay. He said, but if the three boards of county commissioners want to come together in a cohesive way, you can do it. You're, you're elected officials and you, you're, the governor didn't appoint you. 
you were elected officials, you can do it. So that's what we did. And I remember the, uh, the, the team at work with uh, George Ard. At that time, St. Mary's had five commissioners. They were first on board for five commissioners. So I talked with George, and I told him, George, you've heard me sermonize about the Patuxent River, and uh, uh, what's your take on it? Oh, he said, I'm four square behind you. I said, well, are you, are you okay on this, uh, on this suit? Absolutely, absolutely. He said, but he said, I've been thinking about something. He says, Charles County doesn't have much on the Patuxent River. Just around Benedict over there, just got a few miles. And uh, I think that Corbin and St. Mary's ought to pay the lion's share of that. So we worked out a formula, and I think it was 40, 40, and 20. 40% for the two large counties, I mean for the counties that was most affected, and Charles County was 20%. And they paid their dues, just like everybody else. We, we paid all the expenses out of taxpayers' money. Was, was Gary Hodge, was he the executive director of the Tri-County Council? Initially, he, uh, he, he wasn't then. The initial was uh, John Mills, big, tall guy. And he was, uh, he was so educated that he talked. You couldn't have to understand what he was talking about because he was way up here in his conversation. And a uh, lovable guy. But... Uh, we, uh, I guess, country boys like plain talk, you know, and uh, straightforward stuff. Uh, Gary Hyde, when he came on, was a real asset, but the fight had been ongoing then. In fact, Gary wrote a summary from some paper, a magazine. I've got a copy of that. It's a well-done article. Got a picture of you in, in there, you and I in there. And, uh, it must he, have been a great article. Oh, it was, it, yes, <laughs> absolutely. But it was, it was really good stuff that he wrote, and it was absolutely factual. He wasn't wrong on one tittle in it. Uh, Gary was a good person for the river because he thought like we did, the ones that were really on fire for it. We only had one person that was a little bit uh, persnickety about it, I won't mention her name, and because uh, I heard her the night that I was bringing it up to a vote, she had long fingernails, and I could hear her fingernails on the table going like this, you know. And uh, I heard her say, she didn't think I heard it, she said, look, I like Bernie Fowler, but he's not going to tell me what to do. And I said, well, if I don't get her vote, that won't be the worst thing ever happened. But uh, when they finally took the vote, it was unanimous. Everybody voted for it. All the commissioners in Charles, all the commissioners in St. Mary's, and all the commissioners in Carver County voted for it, 100%. Huh. So from there on out, we had, uh, we had a license then to full speed ahead. And that's exactly what we told Mr. Flyshaker to do. You go ahead. Don't worry about the cost. We want to find out. This is, this is Custer's last stand. If we're not able to do something in the court, we're not going to get anything done. The Tri-County Council was uh, one of the things that Governor Tars promised when he took slot machines out of Southern Maryland. Taking slot machines out, that was a lifeblood down here in those days because uh, uh, they, there's just all kind of money coming in from Washington and all points north, you know, a lot of local people played them. But uh, it was money floating all over the place, and they pretty much run the... Uh, run the roost, you know, rule the roost. Uh, the Tri-County Council was one of several things that Governor Tars promised that he would do in the abolishment of slot machines because he knew it was going to be a real economic hardship for Southern Maryland. And uh, so he promised the Governor Thomas Johnson Bridge, uh, the Benedict Bridge, I think, had been built at that time. Yeah. That was one of Louis Goldstein's projects. And he also uh, promised to finish the construction of Route 4 from Huntingtown all the way to Solomon's, plus this regional type of thing, you know, a committee commission that turned out to be the Tri-County Council. That was all of the elected officials uh, in the county commissioner's office and in Annapolis, the senators and the delegates were all a part of that. And uh, at first it was... It was a little, uh, I wouldn't say difficult, but there was a lot of uncertainties about it because initially when they 
uh, put the legislation together, they had each one of the senators and each one of the delegates had a full vote on the commission. But when you took the county commissioners, the board of county commissioners only had one vote. We didn't have three votes. And we didn't like that, so it was my good friend Jim Simpson, Senator Simpson, he turned out to be, he was president of the county commissioners in Charles County at the time, suggested to me one time and several others standing around, it, it's unfair for them to have a full vote. We're local government, we're charged with the executive and legislative uh, duties in, uh, in the counties, and yet we only have one vote for all of us, all three commissioners. And in St. Mary's County, it was uh, one vote for five commissioners. So we just simply said at a meeting, if you want this council to succeed, you're going to have to. You must change the voting ratio. We want equal votes with you. The three commissioners get three votes. Each one of you have a vote. Each one of us is going to have a vote. If you are not agreeable to that, then there will be no Tri-County Council because we are not going to fund it. And uh, very shortly that became an issue, but it very shortly was resolved because they changed it. We all had equal, uh, we all had equal votes. But the Tri-County Council was a wonderful idea, and it was a vehicle that brought all the decision makers together. And, you know, whether it was uh, land use or whether it was the Patuxent River or whether it was economic development or whether it was a health problem or whatever it was, you talked about it in all three counties at these meetings that we had. And uh, we had a central meeting place where we, we hung out for our meetings. And I think we met on a monthly basis. But uh, I found it to be a great resource center and a great opportunity to pick the minds and the brains of, of the people that were in charge of uh, uh, at least uh, administering the law and whatever changes need to be made in Southern Maryland. Uh, it was a great way of doing it. And uh, I give it high marks. I don't know what its function is today particularly, but I know in those days once we got the, the voting equity completed, Everything went on pretty smoothly, but we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't as a tri-county council. That was illegal. We could not sue the state and the federal government. That was the reason we took the three boards of county commissioners, which was perfectly legal, and went with it that way. So, so take us up to the um, to the federal court case. So, you guys were the, the commissioners were suing the uh, state of Maryland, particularly the Department of Natural Resources. I take it and the federal government, EPA. So we we were we. Uh, Mr. Flyshaker, after his research on the possible recourse in courts, recommended that we that we enter into three suits. One was to stop the construction of the Savage Wastewater Treatment Plant until such time as a retrofitted all of the large plants in uh, the dumping into the Patuxent River, which involved Prince George's County, Anne Arundel County. Uh, Montgomery? There was never, there was never any, no discharge uh, in the Patuxent River. There was at one time, we had uh, two discharges in the Patuxent River. We had one at Solomon's and we had one at uh, Parker's Creek. And one of the earliest things that we did when we were sworn into office was to get the experts together working with the state, find us a way to get those pipes out of the river and out of the Parker's Creek area. If we're going to be fighting for the Patuxent River, we want to be clean. So uh, as you well know, it ended up just that way. We have land application of land infiltration or whatever it is. I think they grow trees mm -hmm. on one of them and it's worked very well. So. We could then look at everybody upstream, the other four counties, and say, we don't discharge into the river. We think the river is important enough. It's a precious resource. We're not going to add to the pollution by discharging it. All we're asking you to do is to find some other way to take care of your human waste besides dumping it into the stream. Uh, land application is a perfect solution for you. Uh, that was... Uh, that was the wake-up call for wastewater treatment plants.
So, so you're building up towards getting this case into court. That was all a part of it, and uh, with the absence of uh, cooperation from the regulatory agencies and the governor's office at that time, uh, we agreed with uh, Mr. Flyshaker. We wanted to uh, stop the construction on the Savage Wastewater Treatment Plant. He wanted to uh, uh, back that up with, uh, if, if that wasn't stopped, the next suit would be to require them to do an environmental impact study, which they didn't have to do at that time. And the third one, which was the most important one, under the Clean Water Act of 1972, the state of Maryland was to come up with a plan that would clean up the Patuxent River because it was an impaired river at that time. This is years later. And uh, uh, that was the big suit. Uh, that's the one that, that's the, uh, the one was heard locally in Judge Boyne's court, and he, uh, he disagreed with the suit. He failed to stop the construction on the Savage Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, he did, however, require the environmental impact statement. And I think that went to the appeals court, and the appeals court upheld that. So they had to do an environmental impact statement on Savage Wastewater Treatment Plant. The big one now we waited a little while for. There's a little addendum to the uh, to the court suit that I that I forgot that I think is is, is incredible. Uh, the attorney we had. This is the the suit that the three southern Maryland counties had against the federal government, of the state of Maryland because of the inadequacy of the plan that Maryland had accepted and EPA had agreed to accept. And it was totally contrary to what the, the intent of the law was and uh, totally inconsistent with cleaning up the bay, I mean cleaning up the river. But uh, in order to uh, make a case, he had to have some material and he also had to have some signatures of people that were responsible for that material. And there were five scientists at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory that signed the affidavit that was very convincing to the judge. I believe his name was Judge Sharika, I believe. Sirica. Judge Sharika. Oh, yeah, famous. What a judge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was another one involved, another suit to a Judge Oberdorfer, if you remember that name. Oh, yeah. But this, this suit here was Judge Sharika, and he... Uh, uh, he had to look at those signatures and all, and that was, uh, okay, yeah. that was Rita Caldwell and uh, Joe Mahersky, uh, Don Heinle, uh, finally Heinle, <laughs> and uh, uh, George Krantz, there's a fifth one. And I was in court the day the judge, it was a federal court in the District of Columbia on Pennsylvania Avenue, I think it is. Uh, here was Mr. Flyshaker over on the plaintiff's side, and here's about 30 attorneys over here from the federal government, the state of Maryland, you know. Here's little Mr. Flyshaker all over by himself here, and I'm sitting back there kind of chewing on my nails, you know, I don't know whether we're going to make out here pretty good or not. And it turned out that uh, in the final arguments, the judge ruled in our favor. He simply said that folks in Southern Maryland are right. Uh, the, uh, we've gone over the information, the state plan to clean the river up, and all this does is accommodate more growth. Bigger wastewater treatment plants, larger pipes and all, that's not going to clean the Patuxent River up. So I'm going to put the brakes on everything and the Tuxen River watershed. There'll be no federal funds for domestic water supply or wastewater treatment plant until you come up with a plan. That was uh, the big rule. That is what got Governor Harry Hughes really interested in because he's been, I'm sure, nurtured from all points north. Uh, we've got to get this straightened out some way. So we... Uh, we had him down on a boat trip, if you remember. You were, uh, Walter Boynton was a very important part of that. We started at, uh, at Shorter's, mm -hmm. had uh, 
the two boats from the biological lab was Orion and the Aquarius yep. at that time. And it seems to me we had another smaller boat that carried some overflow of reporters. I don't remember that distinctly, but we didn't have room for all the reporters on the boat that the governor and the scientists and all were on. That was the Aquarius. And uh, so the, the plan for the day was to demonstrate to Governor Hughes uh, something wrong with the river, and we plan to show you what's wrong with the river today. Uh, Walter Boynton was a very, very important part of that because he made a lot of the presentations, as was George Krantz, who was the oyster expert. They dredged oysters up. Uh, as we were going down the river, they'd stop at a bar, dredge some oysters up, put them on deck, and they'd shuck the oysters. You could look at the oyster and watch the oyster die right in front of your eyes. You remember the stylus in the oyster was just, it was nothing but skin and water. There was nothing there. And of course, uh, my, my take on that was uh, that uh, oysters are no different than a human being. When your immune system is down, you know, and you, you don't get the, the proper nourishment and your, your immune system begins to depreciate, you're subject to anything. And I think that's really what happened. And of course, the old MSX and Dermo that had been on board since the 50s, I believe, uh, that, that, that made it a little more, they made the oysters a little more vulnerable to accepting this and that tore the oyster industry up. The governor got all of this. He was a very heady man. He understood when you told him. He understood well. He had a good grasp on it. And Walter was very uh, demonstrative in his presentation so that, you know, you, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to understand what he was telling you was right. George Krantz played a big part in that. But they did core boings. They did a whole bunch of things that really... Uh, uh, exhibited the uh, demise of the river and also suggested the causation. They knew from the records they had been keeping since 1930, I believe, or 29, something like that, they knew uh, that the over-enrichment of nitrogen and phosphorus was the two main culprits, plus the toxicity, because a lot of the plants were using chlorine at that time. And we, we now know that chlorine is very deadly to aquatic life. And so uh, <clears throat> we cruised on to Solomon's Island. We got to Solomon's Island uh, that day. We had a dinner, and I had been chosen to be the keynote speaker, and then the governor was going to respond to my remarks. And I had some prepared remarks, and I stuck to them very closely. And... Uh, it was pretty good stuff, but at, at the very end, I had led one thing. I thought it would, would put him in a mood. I said, Governor, you know, we've just, uh, we've just uh, enjoyed uh, a date that we celebrate in America called Thanksgiving. And it's a time that we pause and we give thanks to our Heavenly Father for all the blessings he's given us and all we have. And so we've, we're thanking the Patuxent River today for all the good things it's allowed us to have. And... Uh, Christmas is not too far around the corner, Governor. It's just around the corner, and uh, you know you could be you could be a big help. You could be Santa Claus this year to us, and clean this river up, and uh, we'd be ever so grateful. We appreciate so much your your company here today and your leadership in the state. We love you, and we hope that our experience with you today will convince you that we do have a problem, and your support will be forthcoming. And, uh, Lord bless you, and that was it. He got up, started making speech. I can see him now. He was a handsome dude, still is. He still really looks good, thick hair. And he said, uh, when he started off, he was, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> and he committed himself. That, that was unusual for a governor to do. He committed himself that day. I'm convinced you do have a problem, and we're going to do something about the problem. What was that something? First thing he did, this was a very bold stride. The federal government did not believe that nitrogen was a serious part of the culprits that was destroying the river. Uh, the hydroscience or hydroqual study, hydroqual study that was done, it was a Professor Brown in charge of that, 
And when he gave us the report, he told us that, uh, hey, you don't have to worry about nitrogen. That is not a problem. But you have serious problems with phosphorus. Phosphorus is what's killing your river. That was contrary to what our good brothers down at Chesapeake Biological Lab had found and was telling us. So in furtherance of their position, they set up a uh, microcosm study over in Benedict, a field station over there, these big large tanks, and they had river water in it, and they would inject phosphorus into one tank, and nitrogen into another tank, and phosphorus and nitrogen into another tank. The first tank, when they put the phosphorus in the saline part of the water, it was very uh, hardly noticeable any growth in the algae that was in the tank. When they put the nitrogen in the second tank, it grew by 700%. When they combined the two of them in the third tank, it became 1,500%. And that was the study that really helped us out in the long run. But we find out in order to demonstrate this, it's going to cost $29 million to take the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the Western Branch, which was the largest wastewater treatment plant on the Patuxent River at that time. And... Uh, Where's the money coming from? Federal government won't give us any money because they're telling us there's nitrogen that won't make a difference. After their study, their study over in Benedict, they were able to convince the federal government nitrogen is a serious contender and you need to rethink your policy. Governor Hughes put up $29 million state cash to take the nitrogen out of Western Branch alone, one plant alone. And uh, the other plants followed suit. But we didn't, we didn't quite get there because the other plants didn't clean the act up, if you remember. They kind of drug the feet on it and didn't, didn't get them cleaned up. Uh, it wasn't until, may I may be getting ahead of you, but I, I think probably was in the late 80s, I put a bill in, in the legislature, which mandated a certain uh, criteria that the major wastewater treatments had to meet by a certain date. If not, pretty heavy fines kicked in, charging them for every pound over nitrogen, every pound over phosphorus that they put in the river past that certain date. And uh, it was uh, pretty easy to get it through the, the Senate. I had a lot of sponsors in the Senate. Got it through the Senate okay. It got over in the House, and they moved it over in the House pretty good. I uh, got to the governor's office, and uh, now we don't have Governor Hughes anymore. We have Governor Don Schaefer, and he was uh, he was dead set to not sign the bill because he said it was a mean bill, very mean-spirited bill, and he didn't like the tenor of it, and he wasn't going to sign the bill. That's what his people told me. And I said, you're kidding me. Don't tell me you're kidding me. This, this can't be so. I mean, I have worked hard on this, and so have hundreds of other people. We know it's the right thing to do. I can't understand. Are you really serious? The governor's not going to sign this bill? And after they convinced me they were kidding me, I got on the phone, got his secretary, and made an appointment, went over, and he and I sat just like we're sitting here now. And uh, uh, Don Schaefer was a good governor. He had a certain temperament and disposition that at times could be a little contentious to work with. But one thing that he respected was a person with integrity and honesty, tell him the truth and don't go behind his back and try to cut him up with the news media, which I never did. I never did with any of the government. And uh, I talked with him and he said, well, why should I do this? I said, Governor, we started back with Governor Mandel, Attorney Birch, Secretary Coulter, all the regulatory agencies, and all we got was promises and nothing's happened. The only way you're going to get this done is to have something mandatory that's going to force them to do it. Otherwise, you will not enjoy any success on the Patuxent River whatsoever. So we talked for a considerable time, and finally he, told, he said, Well, I like you, Bernie. I'll sign the bill. I'll sign the bill. So I got a busload of kids that had testified for the bill at St. Mary's. They brought them up on a bus so they could be there uh, for the photo op because they were very helpful with the bill. And he signed the bill with a lot of fanfare that day. And uh, I know Walter Boynton can verify this for you, that uh, 
uh, not too long after that bill kicked in, and all the major plants met the the standards that we set in that bill, uh, we saw a tremendous improvement in that Patuxent River. Uh, went down for the way it in. I couldn't believe it. The grass was growing back. The water was clear. It, the kids were taking their grass, pulling up, making wigs of it. It was, uh, it was a, a day in history that I'll never forget. And uh, I thought we had turned the curve and everything was going to be okay. But remember, we had 20 million gallons of affluent going into the bay, uh, going into the Patuxent River at that time. Today, as we speak, there's over 60 million gallons per day going in. So the magnitude of the increase in the volume in years, very few years, soon offset the progress that we made uh, by the standards we set. So we had to go back to the drawing board. We worked. Uh, after I got out of the Senate, uh, Walter Boynton was the main part of this. We put another bill together, which would have captured all of those things. It would have brought all of the, the nitrogen and phosphorus content back to where it was in the 1950s at all of the plants in Maryland. And it got passed in the uh, House, came over. It was on third reader in the Senate. And somebody had got to the leadership up there and told them this was going to be so costly that the wastewater treatment plants, small plants and all, they'd have to shut down the trailer parks. People wouldn't be able to have a place to live and all. And the bill got killed. But uh, that's sometimes they say you lose a battle and don't, don't uh, lose a war. So if Sue Cullen is reelected, and I surely hope so, uh, my plan is to go direct it to her when she's sworn in and say, you remember the bill we put in 06? Let's do it again. Let's try it again, see if there's any more sympathy for it. So, enough of that. Well, the famous Chirac. Oh. Now, how, um, and that followed the federal court case decision. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that Chirac. That was, I thought, fascinating. Also, yeah. from my point of view, it was really scary. But yeah. um, tell us about the charrette and how it, why did it come about? Um, Bill Eichbaum, I believe. Bill Eichbaum, John Griffin. They were the two major leaders with my help because, uh, well, we, I have kind of, and I, I apologize for it, but I, I've omitted a very important phase of our struggle for the Patuxent River. And it <clears throat> comes under the umbrella, what we call a charrette, in which you bring people together, uh, that are all the stakeholders together, and you try to, through consensus, hammer out a plan that will take care of the, the problems that you're enduring. Uh, Governor Hughes had told me personally, put his hand on my shoulder and told me personally at some social gathering at the uh, government house, he said, I want to resolve this. I really want to get this resolved. So uh, I'm willing to do whatever we can here to do it. And he said, I know that you want it resolved, absolutely. So he said, I'm going to send uh, Bill Eichbaum and uh, John Griffin down to your house. And you all spend a day and talk about this and see what you come up with. So we started our day off. I was living on a, a bay over there then and I had a 17-foot Mako that I used quite frequently. So I took him out and caught a few blue fish and came in and my wife fixed us a real nice lunch. I had a, a big screened-in porch that jetted out from the house. We sat there and talked about it. And uh, so what do, you, what, do you, what do you think is our best approach? And I said, well, I've been thinking long and hard about this, but I was involved in a, in a uh, procedure. It was called a, a charrette up at University of Maryland that was Planners from all over the place. I don't know whether you were involved in that or not, but uh, they had planners from Howard University and all around the countryside that came. They were setting a plan together for Corbett County. And while their, their plan was 200 years ahead of itself, there was some good stuff in it. But the procedure struck me as being a very appropriate way to deal with the Patuxent River. I suggested this to Bill Eichbaum and also to John Griffin and explained to him how it worked. It sounded like a good idea, so we'll go with it. Then they brought in some uh, uh, 
planning coordinators, I think they were from Boston, yeah, I believe. They were mediators. Mediators, mediators, that's yeah. the correct word. They were mediators. And they, uh, they began to uh, try to put it together. Well, it wasn't working. So finally, uh, John Griffin and Bill Connor took the show over. And he had each of us that was there sit down. We had officials from all of the counties. We had the scientific community, which we were fortunate to have. You, me and Chris Delia. Chris was there. Chris Delia, uh, Walter Boyington. Uh, I can't remember whether Joe Mahersky was there or not. I think Joe was I don't there. believe so. But no press. No press, that no. That was part of the deal. The part of the deal was absolutely no press because we wanted to be able to say what we wanted to say and do what we wanted to do without any repercussions. So uh, it, the plan worked out good. It was a good exercise. And I recall on the very last night we were hammering away. There was a retired general who was the uh, uh, director, I guess you'd call him, of the uh, uh, USSC, wasn't it? Yeah, Public Service Commission. And uh, after, you know, a couple social cocktails and all, he kind of loosened up. And we we're sitting in front of the fireplace, and I said, Why are you so opposed to doing land application? Why don't you be the leader, as a general? Why don't you be the leader and uh, go ahead and take one or two of your plans? Take Western Branch, put it on land application, show the world you can do it, make a real difference and the water quality in that Patuxent River. And uh, after stuttering and talking for a little while, he finally said, okay, I'll agree to do it. And he agreed to do it. Well, we thought we had our problem solved then. But uh, after the shred broke up, we had some pretty good stuff there. And I want to say again, the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory was the they were the linchpin, they were the key to making that successful because they had the scientific data to, to explain, to deal with. They knew how to put it together. And uh, we, we uh, were very fortunate to have that kind of resource. It all came out, I thought, real good. And we were happy. We were kind of patting ourselves on the back, you know, because we've, we've turned the corner here again. And then... Uh, just about the time the general got going on this thing, you know, planning and all, his board called him in and fired him. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of the land application for Western Bryant. Uh, and I don't know what it would have taken to revive that and get it back on track. Uh, anyhow, we never did. I kept heckling him, and every time I'd get a chance, Tuxedo River Commission, I'd harass him about it, you know. Why do you have to dump everything in a river? Why does the Patuxent River have to be beat up because you're trying to get rid of your human waste? Find another way to do it. You know, we've asked you to put it on land, you agreed to it, and then you, you, you turn a, uh, 180 degrees on us. Uh, not too late, but we were never able to convince them because it would take a lot of land, you know, for a plant as large as Western Branch. I think that time there were probably 20 million gallons a day close to it. Probably more than that. Probably, probably that. more than that. But at any rate, uh, that's, the, the charrette was a good exercise and it turned out. Initially I told you they set us all down and the first thing we did was each one of us wrote on a piece of paper our goal for the Patuxen River. And uh, uh, I wrote what I thought was appropriate and uh, I don't know why, but mine was chosen to be, out of all, was, uh, that was chosen to be used as the, uh, as the goals for the Patuxent River. Incidentally, it still serves in a, in a similar way as the goal for the uh, Patuxent River Commission. Uh, it just simply said, take the water clarity and transparency back to what it was in the 1950s. That's, that's a gauge you can use. And... Uh, Generations that follow us deserve no less. We must do this. And they use that as the, uh, as the slogan or the motto for the meeting. Uh, now, you take over. There were a number of um, political people there. Oh, yeah. Who really did not want to be there. That's right. Um, so it was pretty tense. Um, <laughs> my memory was that the facilitators really helped us 
bring those people online, so to speak, and yeah. and work at this issue. Um, a, a second thing I remember is that while you give Chris and I a lot of credit, um, I remember both of us were scared half to death. <laughs> and at one point, a question came up of, with regards to, well, just how much nitrogen and phosphorus comes out of these surge tra treatment plants relative to everything else? And um, uh, Chris and I got scurried off to a little side table. Tom Rymer was hanging over our shoulders, telling us <laughs> to hurry up. <laughs> and Chris and I are scribbling the numbers that we had from various and sundry reports down on a piece of paper. And I clearly remember Chris and I looking at each other saying, do we think this is right? And, um, and, and we agreed we, that, that it was as right as we could make it. Um, so that was largely, I think, our, our contribution to this. And then I remember a period of time where some of the upper counties were grumbling heavily about doing anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember Tom Reimers sort of sliding out of his seat. And what he said was that Southern Maryland will do whatever Southern Maryland needs to do. Yeah. And I remember that as sort of an important moment that that it seemed like, all right, people settled down and absolutely started to move in a positive direction. Absolutely. Um, and also, uh, this was held at a convent. It was. was was interesting, so that every once in a while, <laughs> see, well, no. you see a nun go floating by, and uh, I think that that helped to calm some people down. At least, at, at least the level of cussing and bad language I believe it was did. severely suppressed. I really believe it did. I did too. Absolutely, because you see them come by with their habits, you know, and it yeah. sent a different signal to them, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that where, was. Where was the convent? Explain with us. It was. Show. It was up in uh, Marriott'sville in Howard County. Yeah, yeah Marriott'sville in Howard County. Yeah. That's all I remember about it. I do remember the convent. I do remember once in a while the sisters would go by with their habits on and all, right. you know. Everybody would look, you know, and they're drinking cocktails, and here go the sisters by. But yeah. <laughs> and then at the very end of it, um, when, when we said, okay, this is over, um, Tom Horton was literally standing outside the door to um, interview, you know, try to get a, a statement or two because yeah. he was, you know, still is very committed to trying to get, you know, accurate reporting of. Um, oh my gosh, he's issues. He's he's worth his weight in gold. He really is. So, so part of the charrette, um, I th I thought made some uh, broke new ground. You know, nitrogen was important as well as phosphorus, and that was. That was an early victory. Um, Absolutely. Much of the scientific community still did not agree with that, and certainly the regulators didn't. Um, so that was that was a big deal. What what were the shortfalls? What what should we have done better? The shortfall, and this has happened on a number of occasions, is we. We get almost to the finish line, and then we we get tired and we stop. And we just don't get that last thing we need that compels them to do A, B, C, and D. And that's that's been the uh, that's been the deficit all along. Uh, why we haven't enjoyed more success than we have because just like the plan for the Patuxent River that came out of the charrette. You know, it came out of the court order, uh, all of those. But there was nothing in there that said date lines. There was nothing in there that said anything. It must be accomplished by this date. It must be accomplished by this date. So they, again, just like every plan we have ever had for Maryland, uh, dust collectors on the shelf. That's been the, uh, that's been the, the culprit that's been able to defeat us at every turn of the road. Yeah. Uh, everybody's well-intentioned and they want to do it, but when they find out it's going to cost our county money, they do a different take on it and uh, we just have not been able to get the things done that was required way back in the 1982, I think, when we had the first protection ripper plan yeah. on board.
Let me switch gears here just a little bit, Bernie. Um, one of the issues that has bugged me my whole career is that it, it is difficult to get the public involved in, in some of this stuff, some of these environmental issues. Um, and one of the things that I've always thought a lot about is, um, and one of the things that, that you're, uh, you're the poster child for, are, are trying to communicate the value of the environment to our society, to our, well, to our souls, for that matter. Um, and, and you came up with the weight in and you worked with Tom Wisner on that, as I understand it. Um, and, and that's a way of, of talking about how we relate to these ecosystems, the river in, in this case, or the bay. Um, so, and, and so this is another interesting thing to me. If, if I could think of two, two people that I would say would be the odd couple, you and Wisner would be pretty much <laughs> the mole. <laughs> um, and yet, and yet you were, um, you had known each other for many years. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I know because I'm, I knew Tom for ages, you know, he had the greatest respect for you. Um, and so I, from the point of view, this is not like environmental science. This is more like environmental missionary work. Almost. Yes. Um, you and yeah. Wisdom were, you were buddies on this. We were and, team. Um, and and how, how did that start? And how did the weight in come about? Actually, back in my early days when I was trying to focus attention on the river, I'd always use this. It was kind of corn pone, but I'd always use it, and it seemed to be effective. Uh, when I was a young man at Brooms Island, I could wade out chest high and still look down and see my feet perfectly clear. I could see the grass shrimp in that lush green grass. And uh, uh, Tom Wisner, who became a very dear friend and a person that's so easy to love, uh, he said to me one day, he said, you know, you keep talking about this wading out and seeing your feet when you were young and all. I got a suggestion. Let's let's start doing that. Let's wade out in the river, dress up fit to kill, hold each other's hands, and wade out every year. And that will send a signal to everybody that you are still wading out there, looking to find your feet. And uh, in all fairness, he was the uh, he was the motivator that got me to do that. And I said, you know, it isn't a bad. I've been saying it all along, and not a bad idea. And so we were very casual about the first one. Uh, Tom said, how should we dress? Dress up fit to kill? I said, no, I like to wear what I used to wear when I was a boy. I used to wear coveralls and an old blue denim shirt and, and uh, sneakers and a straw hat. Mother always made us wear a straw hat when we went out in the river. And I said, I like to wear that. He said, that's a good idea. So he did the same thing. Uh, he painted a uh, second disc on the toes of his sneakers. And uh, the first one we had, we had at Brooms Island. Betty Brady, who's been somewhat forgotten out of this, she was, uh, she was so helpful. She was very close to Tom, very close to me. And uh, so the first way we, and we had, we probably didn't have more than, I'm going to guess, a dozen people at the most. And but it was a... What year was that, Brian? That was 1988, okay. 1988, and we uh, we would uh, uh, take our picnic basket, and after we waded in, uh, Tom would get his old guitar out, you know, and start strumming. We all sat around sometimes and make a little fire, roast hot dogs, whatever, because Mr. Rogers had given me permission to use the land down there, and uh, that was uh, probably the most comfortable the most friendliest and the warmest time that I had during my uh, struggle for the Patuxent River because that kind of lifted the burdens of you relaxed among people you knew loved you and you loved them. And we uh, we talked river talk and we'd sing song, you know, uh, uh, Ches Chesapeake Born, or we'd sing... Uh, uh, one he sang about old oh, Captain, Captain's gone. Now I forget his name. He wrote that Captain about old oh, Captain's gone. Captain's gone. <laughs> that was for Martin Oberry. Huh? Martin Oberry. 
Martin Obey, the captain's gone. Yeah. And uh, he just, uh, he wrote all of these songs, and uh, they were good. They were good stuff. Uh, the kind of things that if you had affection for the, for the river and the bay, it, uh, it really blended in, and you just wanted to keep singing and singing. And we did that for a few years, and then all of a sudden, politicians started to show up because we got front page coverage on everything we did. Here comes a politician, and, uh, which wasn't a bad idea because they were the ones that had to make the decision. And I really thought at the time that we were going to, uh, we were really going to get some positive connections with them. We were going to get some people that were going to die on their sword if necessary to clean that river up. But that didn't happen then, and it hasn't happened yet. But that was the uh, that was the genesis of the way then, and it goes on. And uh, I have. I haven't kept count of the weigh-ins, but I've done as many as 11 weigh-ins in one year. I went to the Papsco River one time, and it took me almost all day long to go up there and back because they had a long program. They were all waited in, went at a feast afterwards. I've waited in the Rhodes River, the Potomac River, and a half a dozen places, uh, St. Mary's River. Uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember them all, but I've done as many as 11 weigh-ins in one year, and it really caught on all around. The reason for that is after we was enjoying success down here, Tom and I decided that, uh, well, let's don't be selfish. Let's see if we can't spread this to other jurisdictions. So I wrote letters to all of the tributary strategy teams inviting them to come down for wade in And many of them came, and they liked the idea. They went back home. The next year, I wrote them a letter well in advance of the June date and told them, you know, thanked them for coming and all, and uh, why don't you, sir, consider having a weight in in your, in your tributary? So uh, they did, and it's ongoing still all around the state. I don't think it's probably as uh, eventful now as it was a few years ago. Uh, sadly, and I, I hope I'm wrong, I hope, hope I'm proved to be wrong, but I'm beginning to see less interest and less enthusiasm in cleaning up what I believe to be one of the greatest estuaries in the world, not just the United States of America. And uh, that bothers me because, you know, it's like when the tire goes flat, the car doesn't go and the car stops. And that's my fear because uh, with all we're doing in environmental education, with our young people and trying to uh, keep abreast with the adult population and all we do to make them aware of what's going on. I think they look at the hundreds of millions of dollars that has been spent doing this and then they see that uh, progress is very, very slow. The dates for enjoying the Clean Bay are so far down the road now we've lost track of it. I'm afraid that uh, there'll come a time when people like us who have a uncompromising determination and interest and affection for the water quality uh, will begin to wane. And uh, when our voices leave, you know, the, the planet for whatever the reason, uh, what happens then? Uh, computers take over? I don't think so. I don't think so. While computers is a, a genuine piece of technology that has made life so easy for a lot of people, it also has its curses with it. And uh, I'm just unsure at this point. I, I don't feel good about the future because, uh, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be that, that uh, level of urgency anymore. You know, it's, it's okay, you know, 2017 when we, uh, uh, 2017 when we get the uh, wastewater treatment plants straightened out. And yet, uh, Walter Boyne and I have talked many times about this. When they get them all cleaned up and get them in operation and they reach their full potential, their full potential, that is their limits, of uh, flow 
in the plants, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that they're dumping into the river then, although early on it shows an improvement, will be what it was in 2010. That's four years ago. And, and I can't suggest to anybody with any intelligence at all that that's real progress. To me, that's a, uh, that's a real downturn. And uh, I've, I've been sermonizing on this. I, I didn't say anything until I talked with Walter Boynton and we, we kind of collaborated on it and, and decided that, yeah, this is a fact. You could say this because I was saying there will be uh, more nitrogen and all. And uh, Dr. Boynton corrected me and said that, no, use the year 2010. You'll be accurate then. Nobody can refute that. Just say it will be uh, no less than it was in 2010. And that was two years ago we talked. Now we're talking about four years ago. I've talked with the uh, several of the environmental uh, EPA people. Uh, Walter Boynton was present with me when we talked with one in Annapolis uh, last year, I believe it was. He was very impressed, but when he walked out of the room, he walked out saying, you know, I believe every word you're saying, and that's all we got. And um, what I'm saying, I'm going to say again, and I hope that if you get a chance to view this, this statement will ring out in your ears that you'll never forget it. We really need to jumpstart the Bay program again. We need to have people understand the severity of the situation is not just the loss of the aquatic life, which is a, a great loss. It is not a lot of other things, but it's now it's becoming a health hazard. We are seeing signs of the Vibrio volnificus showing its ugly head in the Tuxen River. And uh, uh, how do you make that better? You make that better by, uh, they say it's caused by high salinity and high temperatures. And I also, uh, on my own, say that it's also water quality plays a part in that. And the reason I say that is because we never knew of that before. It may have always been here, but it, it was never uh, excited or accelerated to where it became a real threat. Now it is a real threat. And uh, so health is a very serious consideration. And if we lose, if we lose the Patuxent River, and the Chesapeake Bay to where it becomes, it becomes uh, unusable. Uh, that's the heart of Maryland. Uh, all the resuscitation in the world won't bring that heart back. I think even we can reach a point of no return, and I don't know how soon that's going to happen. But uh, there is hope, and uh, there is still an opportunity. But the windows are becoming less. And uh, while there's, you know, a lot of uh, reason to gloat over the increase in the oysters, you know, the aquaculture program and all, that's a very, very healthy sign. But uh, there are other things that we have little jurisdiction over. The stuff that comes out of the Susquehanna, the Susquehanna River, 22 billion gallons a day comes out of that Susquehanna, comes into the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay. It don't disappear when it gets in Chesapeake Bay. It goes on thriving, and the problems that they have up there is sooner or later going to be all over. It's going to be a universal thing. And we now have New York, uh, we have Delaware, we have West Virginia that are bona fide partners in the Chesapeake Bay Commission. EPA is saying they must be part of it because they are part of the watershed. And... Uh, how do we convince people in New York City that rarely ever see the Chesapeake Bay that this is an important undertaking and should not be taken lightly, even though you are not a part of the bay? Uh, this is the United States of America, and we need to use this. This has been a universal observation. All over the world, people are watching what's happening in the Chesapeake Bay in hopes that we'll find a solution that may resolve the problems that are generating elsewhere in the world. Uh, a lot of work to do, long ways to go, but uh, remember the eight words, never give up, never, never, never give up, and that's what we should do. Winston Churchill. Winston <laughs> Churchill. Yeah. I, always, I always give old Winnie credit for that. Yeah. 
I never will forget the story they told on him. Uh, he and Lady Astor, was it? it was Lady Astor? Oh, yes. Yeah, she, uh, uh, they, they didn't get, yeah, they didn't get along good. <laughs> and uh, old Winston liked a little libation. So he was at this party that one night with, with her, and he was feeling pretty good. And she walked up to him and she said, Winston, you know one thing. She said, you are drunk. And if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. And he looked right back at his session, and if you were my wife, I'd be gladly drinking. <laughs> Is so great. He was one sharp dude. Oh, he was. A Bertie, tell, tell us a little bit about, um, at, at least for, you know, with my knowledge of what you've done, um, you, you've been a, a long, long term member of um, Chesapeake Bay Commission and uh, the Patuxent River Commission. Yeah. Both of those are um, groups that are trying to do to move, move this restoration forward. Um, and you've served with them for decades. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, 32 years on the Patuxent River, and I think Ann told me it was 28 years on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. I haven't verified that, but she says she believes it's 28. I am the longest standing member of the Chesapeake Bay Commission now. Many of them have uh, crossed the River Jordan. Some of them have just retired because of whatever the reason. And... Uh, particularly if they left office, you know, there's, if, if once you leave the office, there's only one other way to serve on the Chesapeake Bay Commission, that's to be a, a the representative mm -hmm. from that jurisdiction. That's what they call them, a citizen representative? Citizen representative. And that's why I'm serving on it now. Uh, it's, uh, it's like everything else we've done. It's collaborative volunteerism. There's no compelling reason to do it except the integrity and the desire of the members involved. And uh, earlier I mentioned about the addition of the other states now that are part of it. And I hope that they will think very unselfishly and know that uh, to, to be an isolationist is not appropriate for this situation. They must be a part of it because they are a part of it. They're contributing to the demise of it. They must be a part of fixing that. Uh, but in the final analysis, both of those commissions have no authority to do anything. All they can do is talk, and they can talk, and they can talk. And uh, uh, I think the, uh, in the Patuxent River uh, Commission in particular, I think the numbers are too high. They have 38 members there. It's kind of unwieldy. Uh, when it was first legislated, the Protection River Commission, we had uh, seven members, one from each of the county. Mm -hmm. And it had to be an elected official from that county or the next of kin. In other words, someone close to that elected official that had some authority. We were able to get some things done then. We were able to make decisions quickly. And now it's, uh, uh, I know Walter has served on that commission, and I wouldn't be surprised if his if his assessment isn't doesn't coincide with mine. But while their intentions are good, the the progress they're making is uh, not very measurable. And uh, the Chesapeake Bay Commission, I think, has been uh, very helpful because they've been able to pride and keep the particularly with the governors involved, the executive committee, which is a governor from each of the state the mayor of the District of Columbia and the citizens representative, I'm sorry, the chairman of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. And uh, they're able to at least talk to each other. But when you look at the actual progress, the measured progress, you can look at some things like the, the farm bill, which was pretty much down the tube. The Chesapeake Bay Commission was very instrumental in resurrecting that, getting that passed. And that was very... Uh, a very integral part of the, the whole game plan was to uh, help to support the farmers in their effort to do what they need to do to uh, decrease the problem. So, so you were you were part of that lawsuit that Chesapeake Bay Foundation took to the federal government. And that this total maximum daily load is the pollution diet for the bay. 
Um, and that really signified the change from a voluntary, collaborative type of restoration to one that is um, more quantitative and mandatory. So what do you think of it? Well, the, uh, the uh, TMDLs was a long time coming, and of course uh, we can all understand that if you don't, if, if you've got foreign material going in that's killing the river, and you don't take enough of that out to stop the death of that river or that estuary, uh, it's going to die. So that is an absolute that has to be. And yet, uh, you know, we thought everybody was on board for that. But it turns out that on the TMDL, we had uh, 21 attorney generals from 21 states that entered suit against EPA to stop this, saying they didn't have the authority to do this. Uh, fortunately, the judge that heard it, I think, had upheld it. And it's uh, it's still alive and kicking. What will happen down the road? I think they've taken an appeal on it. We're not quite sure of. But uh, it's like uh, every other thing that you attempt to do with the Chesapeake Bay. It's the old adage that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. And that's very true with the Chesapeake Bay. Everybody wants to clean the bay up. But when they find out they're going to have to pay a rain tax, they're going to have to pay a flush tax, they're going to have to pay this or pay that uh, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the flush tax, that, that there's money there to do the job. Uh, it took a long time to get where we are in terms of the demise. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money to bring it back. And uh, it's going to be a very costly project. I'll give you one example, I'm told in Anne Arundel County just the stormwater alone will cost them in excess of two billion dollars and that may be a very conservative figure. And uh, we've, 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 got to, we've got to look at this and know that, uh, you know, it's like fighting World War III. It's going to be costly but it's essential if we're going to save the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the, the, the commission now stays in pretty good stead because uh, I think we helped them a little bit on that. Will Baker, who is president of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, called me on the phone and talked with me at some length and wanted to know if I would consider being the lead plaintiff in a suit against EPA. And they were suing because they failed to abide by the, the covenants of the Clean Water Act, which was passed in 1972 and again had just kind of set up there on a the shelf without anybody doing anything. And uh, this lawsuit was settled out of court, but the best legal minds, the documents that we signed off on, the best legal minds in the country say that if EPA reneges on any one of those, any one of those requirements, that we have uh, a right to go into the court, and they're extremely confident that the judiciary will force them to do it because they've signed this agreement and it has, uh, it has some uh, validity in terms of its, its potency in getting the job done. So that's, you know, that's a real positive and that's a real sign of hope. That makes the light at the end of the tunnel a little larger and uh, we want to make it glow and get bigger and bigger. We want that light at the end of the tunnel to get much larger than the dead zones in the bay. And, uh, well said. Um. You, you know, <laughs> either because I've asked you or because of the conversation, um, you've gone through my questions. Um, and so, to <laughs> my last one. Um, so, um, what's the future hold? What, what's your view of that for the Bay? Well, An optimistic one or, or I, I stay optimistic. I know sometimes my remarks uh, appear to be opposite of that, but I do that because I uh, feel the truth will set us free, and I think I need to tell the truth. I, I don't need to say, oh, the dead zones are smaller, uh, and there's no such thing as Vibrio. I've got to tell the truth about it, you know. Uh, 
I think we have, I think we have hope. I think there are things going on. I call it the, the uh, Chesapeake Triangle, not, nothing like the Bermuda Triangle, but there's three parts of it. When, uh, when we entered suit against EPA and we did a rally up in front of the, uh, the federal court building in Washington, D.C., and uh, there's a crowd of people there, and I will forget, Will Baker said to me, uh, Bernie said, get up on the stage and see if you rock these people some. So I got up, and it, it was a fortunate time for me because I always get the signals I need to say some things that, that impact them, and it went over good. But uh, that court suit, in my judgment, my personal opinion, was the action needed to encourage the President of the United States to sign an executive order requiring EPA to come up with a plan on 120 days that would uh, restore the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, 120 days, they did just that. They came up with a plan. Uh, they're sticking to it pretty good. So far, the courts have upheld them. And the TMDL, for instance, that we talked about earlier, uh, I do think they have the tools now to get the job done. Uh, the the downside, this again is personal, is the length of time it's taken to do it. And I mentioned before, and it doesn't hurt to repeat it because I think it's worth saying, I would have loved, when I started with the, uh, with the uh, Tuxen River in 1969, once we got things moving, we got the governor on our side, we had people convinced, hey, something is wrong with the river, thanks to Chesapeake Biological Lab, uh, then uh, you just, you, you, were, you were on a roll, and you felt that uh, things were going to happen. And then when we, we had the governor intervene and put $29 million in to take the, the nitrogen out, and uh, you all proved nitrogen was a culprit, uh, Phosphorus was very damaging up in this uh, freshwater part of the river, but uh, didn't have much influence in the lower part except when combined with the nitrogen. And uh, all of these things, uh, all of these things were were very, very, very bright, very encouraging. And uh, uh, the next thing you've got uh, the you've got the suit, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. You've got the executive order by the president. You've got EPA c complying with that. Uh, there's a third thing now. It's uh, not jumping out at me too quick. There's one other thing that's a very... Clean air, less nitrogen deposition? Yeah, that we do have, we do have high hopes now that uh, air deposition, which is probably 25% of the problem, uh, uh, sooner than we think, uh, they're going to have a handle on that, and we'll be we'll be making some headway there. So there's uh, there's the triangle, and there are, there are reasons for all of us to have hope. Uh, the reason for us not to give up. The reason for us not to be uh, hoodwinked into thinking it it isn't worth it. There are billions and billions and billions of dollars to be earned out of that Patuxent River if we get it back to where it was productive and the aquatic life is good and healthy again. So there is, there are more reasons to do it than not. But even if you dismiss all of that, human health is extremely, extremely important. And that should not be uh, minimized. It should not, it should be underscored and not taken as a very subtle part of the problem. <coughs> You know, I've been giving these um, talks to the county commissioners for, oh boy, 25 years, once a year. Yeah. And um, um, it's only been in the last couple of years where one of the questions that they would ask every year, one commissioner in particular, um, was, uh, is it safe to swim? And, you know, that's, that should be a no-brainer. Yeah. The answer should be, of course it's safe to swim. Yeah. But um, there's a caveat attached to that nowadays, and uh, which is what you're talking about. Yeah. So, 
Michael, I'm out of questions. Okay. Have I done okay? You've done very well. There's been a theme that's come up where Don, you said Don Heinley got pressure, even from within the university. Gene Cronin and Harry Hughes are both turned down for the Chesapeake Bay Commission. I mean, is this the price of environmental activism on the part of scientists? Is that... I, I couldn't say that. I think in the case of Don Heinley, yes. There's no question about it in my mind. Having talked with people and understanding that the kind of personality he was and the character he was, yeah, I think it was payback for him, I really do. <clears throat> in terms of Dr. Cronin and uh, Governor Hughes, uh, there could have been a little bit in there for Dr. Cronin because I know uh, Dr. Cronin was, uh, had sort of a, of a replica of what the thoughts of Dr. Truett was. Dr. Truett used to say, unless you manage the oyster industry, uh, better than you're doing now, sooner or later you won't have any oysters. Because when John Smith sailed up, the oysters on low tide, the reefs was out of the water. You won't find that now. <laughs> you won't find that. You don't find the huge mountain of shells that Warren Denton's oyster house. In fact, the oyster house is now a, a uh, cocktail or beer joint, whatever you want to call it. 